<laughs> Welcome to our first uh, Australian Future Human um, Jim Crack Journalism hosted at the Surrey Hills Library. Um, Future Human is a night that I um, started in London with Jack Roberts. Uh, we ran a little publishing company there. Um, it, it is a night which has run in London for two years, but this is the first time we're doing one in Australia. And uh, the idea of the night is a sort of theatre of innovation, an intellectual salon for a new age of radical change and, and innovation, and, and looking at how technology changes people's lives, affects people's lives positively and, and negatively. Um, so we've done nights about data journalism and seasteading and uh, the future of music. But we've never done one in Australia, so this is our first. Um, and um, we're, we've been um, brought here today uh, in conjunction with Anders Hand magazine um, and uh, through its editor, Alice Gage, who's currently in London. Um, and also, as part of a schedule of events uh, at the Surrey Hills Library, curated by Eddie Sharp. Yay! Yay! Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Eddie and Alice. Before I introduce the, the subject for tonight, I'd like to introduce our panelists. And I, I really think we've got uh, the perfect panel for this particular subject. It, it's, uh, we have a, people who uh, operate right across the industry and, and, and I think will be able to give us perspectives on all angles. And people like me who have food on their shirts. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to my right, Richard Acklin, journalist, journalist, publisher, lawyer, most of you um, I'm sure already know of him, um, but particularly importantly, publisher. Um, Richard, uh, as a, sort of a publisher of Justinian and the Gazette of Law and Journalism, uh, has been running print publications for decades, which have now, I think, successfully transitioned to online publications. So I, I think, apart from being a journalist, Richard also sees the economics behind print journalism uh, and, and can give us some perspective on that tonight. Peter Atkinson on, on the far end of the panel, uh, Group Managing Editor of Page Masters. Um, Page Masters probably first came onto most people's calendars this year um, when, I guess controversially for some people, 82 of the sub-editors at Fairfax newspapers were made redundant and um, they were, the, 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 the roles that they had were then taken on by Page Masters. But Page Masters doesn't only do uh, sub-editing work, they do design, they do editorial listings, and they do iPad applications. So they provide services to a lot of news institutions. Um, and also, I mean, it's worth mentioning, it's, it, it, uh, it's not the first time that a, a quality <coughs> newspaper has used page masters. Um, uh, uh, notably, the Daily Telegraph, one of the big uh, broadsheets in London, uh, used, uh, shifted to page masters for their sub-editing duties in 2009. So Peter, I think, has a, a, a great perspective on how the, how the industry is changing, the, the raw economics of, of how news is produced, and, uh, and it's great to have him on the panel. Um, Peter Smith, just here next to Richard, uh, he is the Asia-Pacific correspondent for uh, the Financial Times. He's worked in different countries across the world, and I think in, in, in the UK and the US, um, some of these changes to, uh, to newsrooms are happening much more rapidly. So I. I I think Peter can give us some really good perspective on what's happening overseas. Um, and Elmo Keep, writer and producer with the ABC television show Hungry Beast. Um, she's uh, investigated Google's <coughs> Don't Be Evil mantra and whether or not that's um, an oxymoron. Um, uh, explored what happens to your emails when you die and is also a freelance writer, a blogger. And from the, the discussions we had before, uh, the panel I think is pretty au fait with a lot of new media developments and. Um, where newsrooms are heading. So thanks to the panelists tonight. Um, and I'd now like to sort of introduce the subject of this um, debate, which is Jim Crack journalism. So Jim Crack is something that's made relatively cheaply. Um, and uh, we can debate the economics of journalism, but I think you know, most people will agree that the revenue model behind print journalism is in some kind of decline, possibly terminal. Um, so the question then is, how do we produce news journalism? How does a newsroom run as the revenues decline? Uh, what is essential to a newsroom and what are the sacred cows in a newsroom? Uh, and and, and what, what must be there for good journalism to happen? I think that's kind of actually a pretty difficult question to answer. And to sort of, you know, lead into that, I'd like to compare two newsrooms. Um, and they're on opposite ends of the spectrum and I think they both work brilliantly but they're completely different and those are the newsrooms of the New Yorker and the newsrooms of where, that I work in, in a newswire for the Financial Times. Um, one is 
quite old and, and quite distinguished. One is relatively new, but um, I'll just run through them quickly. So if you write for the New Yorker, you, you will be commissioned, you'll do your research, you'll write the article, you'll show it to an editor, there'll be initial suggestions, they'll threaten to spike the piece. Inevitably, you may be, you know, eventually you may be accepted. There'll be a ruthless fact check that will last weeks. And then finally, it'll be handed into the machine of their editorial system. And this system is very complicated. So first, the piece goes to a copy desk. They try and enforce the New Yorker House style, which includes all these sort of uh, you know, grammatical anachronisms, like I'm um, using a tremor over the second vowel of a diuresis, <laughs> and words like cooperate and re-elect, and spelling uh, theatre and travelling in the British way for some unknown reason, even though they're Americans. Um, <laughs> once the copy desk person is finished, doing this, it goes and it gets goulded. Now, goulding is this process which is a little bit difficult. To, it's very hard to work out what it is and they've never really disclosed it, but they had an employee called Eleanor Gould Packard, who was a grammarian and used to, I guess, tear apart sentences and look at syntax and grammar and try and uh, clarify meaning. So this goulding process happens. The third step is uh, two people called page okayers get the article following stage one and two and they make sure that through the goulding and the copy desk process, mistakes haven't been introduced into the piece accidentally. They read it twice and prepare a report which is sent to an editor. An editor then incorporates the changes they like and sends it to the layout department. The layout guys lay it out, send it back to the page okayers who then get angry because their changes haven't been incorporated. Then the page okayers, the editor, the writer, the fact checker and the proofreaders have a closing meeting. They sit down and debate what the changes are and why they should be in and why they shouldn't be in. The page OKs prepare a pristine proof called a reader's proof on the basis of the notes from this meeting. It's sent back to the layout department. It comes back again to a, another level of proofreaders called the Night Foundry Readers, which sounds a little bit like Game of Thrones. And they compare this to the final, the, the final laid out page to the reader's proof and then they publish. So if that sounds kind of a little bit Byzantine or boring, you're not the only person to have that intuition. When, the, when, the, when this process was first leaked to Tom Wolfe in 1965, he proceeded to write this 10,000 word broadside of William Shawn, the editor at the time, about the ossified culture of the New Yorker and how it was an institution overrun with pusillanimous librarians. And the title of the speech was Tiny Mummies, the, the true story of the rulers of 43rd Street, uh, the, the 43rd Street's land of the walking dead. Um, now, in spite of what you think of Wolf's bombastic style, um, I think he certainly struck on some kind of important point, which is that there is a big tribal cultural difference between editors and journalists, and it's good and it's bad, and there is a balance. Um, you know, the editors are the sort of loud, coffee drinking, slightly sort of unscrupulous people trying to go out and scoop their competitors and have lots of alcohol with their sources and find out information. The, the editorial cadre are sort of more phlegmatic, dependable, um, they're a civilising force, they're sort of like the parents in the family of the newsroom. 